Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Laura Kate Bender, National Assistant Vice President for Healthy Air at the American Lung Association. We're honored to have you with us for today's conversation, Looking Ahead, a Roadmap for Healthy Air and Equitable Climate Action for the Biden Administration. The Lung Association is proud to partner with American University's Center for Environmental Policy and Center for Environmental Filmmaking for today's event. This is just the latest of several virtual events that our organizations have held together on clean air and climate change over the past year. So if you missed them, we invite you to watch the recordings. We'll share the link to those recordings at the end of today's presentation, along with more information about how you can join the American Lung Association's air quality efforts through our Stand Up for Clean Air initiative. A couple quick logistical notes for today's event. First, we'll be recording and posting today's presentation as well. Second, please use the Q&A function to ask questions. And third, please use the hashtag clean air for all to participate in the conversation on Twitter. Climate change is a health emergency, but it's also a health opportunity. The emergency is that people across the country are experiencing health harms due to climate change right now. Chances are you know this firsthand, maybe because it's impacted the air you breathe with smoggier summers or more dangerous wildfire smoke. And between climate change impacts, the COVID-19 pandemic, and dirty power plants, ports, and highways that pollute neighboring communities, people are facing multiple threats to their lung health at once. That's the emergency. But the opportunity is that we can address these problems together. Solutions to the climate crisis can clean up the industries that have endangered surrounding communities for decades. Economic recovery from the COVID-19 crisis can drive investment in clean non-combustion energy and create healthier communities. And centering health equity in these discussions can begin to reverse generations of environmental racism and harm to the health of millions of people in low-income communities and communities of color. Imagine communities where every resident lives along a safe route to walk or ride a bike and can hop on clean public transportation when they need it and can purchase an electric vehicle if they choose. Imagine charging that vehicle with clean, renewable electricity that doesn't pollute the air or make people sick. Imagine a future where no child has to live in fear of an asthma attack because of their zip code or their socioeconomic status or the color of their skin. Our thinking is this, if we focus on making the biggest gains we can for human health, and if we prioritize action in the most polluted communities, then we can solve the climate crisis and ensure a healthier, more equitable future at the same time. In today's presentation, you'll hear from a panel of experts as they lay out their ideas and priorities for what they'd like to see President Biden and Vice President Harris do to make this future a reality. But first, I'm honored to introduce a senior official from the Biden-Harris administration to share what actions have been taken on climate, healthy air, and equity so far. Joseph Goffman is the Acting Assistant Administrator for the Office of Air and Radiation at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. He recently returned to EPA after serving from 2009 to 2017 as the Associate Assistant Administrator for Climate and Senior Counsel in the Office of Air and Radiation. Since 2017, he has served as the Executive Director of the Environment, Environmental and Energy Law Program at Harvard Law School. We are so grateful to have him here now to join us to share a few remarks. Joe, the floor is, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to uh, uh, speak uh, on behalf of the Office of Air and Radiation uh, at the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, I think it's uh, auspicious that one of the first appearances that um, I've made, in fact, this is the first public appearance I've made since uh, joining the Office of Air and Radiation again. Uh, and the reason I think it's auspicious is that, as you know, President Biden himself has prioritized um, uh, prioritized dealing with climate change, protecting public health, making progress on environmental justice, and restoring the proper place of science and the rule of law in all policymaking. Um, one of the things that I think people have noticed the most about the president's action in the last two weeks is the executive orders uh, he's issued. Um, uh, reflecting those very priorities and committing to putting them into action. And he's turned in part to the Environmental Protection Agency to deliver on the results that those executive orders contemplate. Um, the reason that a panel discussion and a discussion with you all like this is so important is that whether you look at the words of the executive orders, uh, uh, discern their spirit, or listen to uh, uh, Secretary Michael Regan, who 
testified yesterday in front of the Environment and Public Works Committee in support of his nomination to be administrator. Um, one of the key elements going forward will be the Biden administration's and in particular EPA's engagement with the public. Uh, not only experts like the experts you'll be hearing from, but members of and representatives of all communities across our society. Uh, events like this where I anticipate that you all will be sharpening your focus on the key agenda items um, that support President Biden's priorities are essential to making sure that the engagement that the EPA undertakes and the administration more broadly undertakes um, can be uh, as productive as possible. Um, if we can hear the voices, the blended voices of experts like our panelists and key members of the public uh, and members of critical communities, then President Biden's priorities have the best possible chance of being realized. Um, one of the things that I can report from my two weeks at the Office of Air and Radiation um, is that the executive orders of the president have activated the strength of the EPA, and that is its expert staff, a staff that comprises virtually every conceivable discipline, uh, technical, legal, public engagement, communications, and the agency staff and its personnel resources are already uh, hard at work in gear um, to deliver on the president's priorities generally and on the list of uh, specific directions he gave the agency. But one thing to understand is that those directions were simply part of a much broader whole. What the staff of the EPA heard when Secretary Regan testified yesterday and when they read the executive orders is not, again, not just the words on the page, but the broader spirit um, uh, of the executive order and of Secretary Regan's priorities. So that what the agency and through its staff is committed to delivering is not just an item by item uh, 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 conducting of individual rules, but an integrated whole or integrated outcome for the public um, and for uh, communities whose uh, urgency is to enjoy enhanced environmental and public health protection um, from uh, air pollution, water pollution and waste, uh, as well as from the uh, ill effects of climate change. Um, the, uh, uh, the hosts, and you and the audience were extremely kind to allow a representative of EPA to come uh, deliver some brief remarks and then uh, and then uh, uh, and then depart. Um, but I did really want to convey that um, uh, two weeks in, not only are the political appointees at the agency hard at work, um, but more critically, the expert staff is. Um, already intent on delivering on the president's priorities. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to uh, turn it over to the people you really came to hear from, and that is the members um, of, this, of this excellent panel from whom my colleagues and I at the EPA hope to hear uh, soon as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. You get as much out of this event um, as we at EPA hope to in the days and weeks to come. Thank you so much, Joe. We all appreciate how science expertise and a drive for environmental justice will be at the core of EPA's work. I know you can't stay for the rest of the conversation now, but I do really hope everyone listening today takes you up on your offer and your request to engage with the administration about the actions they'd like to see EPA take. Yes, uh, we're, uh, we're all looking forward to, to that engagement. So thank you again. Pleasure to have you talk. At the American Lung Association, we're keenly aware of the health impacts of the pandemic, the need for quality affordable health care, and the need for cross-cutting public health solutions. 
So we're heartened by the recognition of the president about this integrated approach and that there's an opportunity to do just that. The Clean Air Act provides powerful tools to meet these overlapping challenges. And of course, the Biden administration needs to use all the tools in the toolbox. I'm excited to now shift our conversation to our panel, which will look at the solutions through the clean air and climate lens and talk about how, as President Biden has said, the nation can deliver environmental justice in communities across America. To lead that conversation, I'm honored to turn the program over to our moderator for today's event, Kelsey Brueger. Kelsey is a reporter with e, e News, where she covers climate change, environmental policy, and the White House. She previously covered politics, the White House, and the Energy Department for Energy Wire. She joined e, e News in 2018 after working as a reporter in California, where she covered offshore oil, immigration, cannabis, and politics for the Santa Barbara Independent. Her work has also appeared in Scientific American and Coastlines. Kelsey, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Laura Kate, and um, thank you all for joining us. Um, I have to say it's been a very busy time to be an environmental reporter in Washington, D.C. over the past several weeks. Um, already we've seen President Biden assert that science will be the bedrock of his approach to environmental policy and including on, you know, regulations on ozone and fine particulate matter, for example. Um, you know, in just the first week, he issued several executive actions on climate and environmental matters and promised to take a look at some uh, Trump administration actions. Um, so far, you know, we've seen progressives be encouraged by some of his political appointments um, in the, the White House Regulatory and Budget Office. They have expressed, um, you know, encouragement by the fact that he issued an executive order on day one saying he would take a new approach to uh, regulatory review. Um, environmentalists say that will be, you know, a necessary path to, to achieve some of his goals, um, some ambitious goals on, on climate. So I guess that, that what that brings us to is, you know, how does he achieve everything that he has set out to do? And I guess more to the point, how does, does he assert more presidential power than his predecessors have done to achieve these climate and environmental goals? Um, so I guess to kind of dig into that a little bit, um, that brings us to our panel. Um, and um, I am just going to uh, dive right in. First, uh, we will have Ann Weeks, um, is the, who is the legal director at the Clean Air Task Force, a nonprofit focused on legal policy and technical solutions to climate change and clean air problems facing the U.S. and the globe. Ann has been an attorney with the task force since its inception in 1996. Her work at the task force includes leading its legal team and representing nonprofit, environmental and public health organizations in administrative proceedings and in federal court on a wide variety of climate and clean air matters. Prior to joining the task force, Anne worked as an attorney with uh, the energy program at the Conservation Law Foundation and as an associate with the energy and environmental practice at Dickstein Shapiro in Washington, DC. She also had a previous 10 year career in environmental and land use planning, culminating in a position as an assistant director of the city county planning for Durham, North Carolina. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Adrian Hollis, who's the senior climate justice and health scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists. She has more than 20 years of extensive experience in the environmental arena, particularly focused on environmental justice, equity and inclusion, and the adverse and the adverse health effects of environmental exposures and climate change on vulnerable communities. As an associate professor in public health and as an environmental toxologist. She's also an environmental attorney in her role at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Dr. Hollis works with environmental justice communities to identify priority health concerns related to climate change and other environmental assaults and evaluates climate and energy policy approaches for their ability to effectively address climate change and benefit uh, underserved communities. Uh, prior to joining UCS, uh, Adrian ser served as the Director of Federal Policy at WE Act for Environmental Justice. Currently, she is an adjunct professor at George Washington University Milton School of Public Health in the NYU School of Law. Um, we also have Ali Mirza, Mirza Kali Lee. He is the Administrator of Air Quality Division for um, Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. Ali has been with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality since 2018 
in his position, Ali is responsible for all aspects of air quality program in Oregon, including on climate change, criteria of pollutants, air toxics, and visibility. Uh, prior to coming to Oregon, he served as the director of the Division of Air Quality with Delaware's Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. He's provided expert testimony before the US Senate and House Committees on Clean Air Act issues and has been involved in numerous litigations regarding the Clean Air Act. Ali served as the co-president of the National Association of Clean Air Agencies and co-chairs its permitting and new source review committee. He's also on the board of directors of the Western States Air Resource Council and is its current treasurer. And um, finally, we have uh, Marcy Reed, who's the president of the National Grid um, Massachusetts Business and, ex um, and Executive Vice President of US Policy and Social Impact. She is responsible for the gas and electric uh, business, uh, businesses in Massachusetts, including their operational customer service, financial, and reputational outcomes. In addition, she leads energy policy development for the US business and the effective implementation of New Grid's new social mobility platform. Uh, Marsh, she joined National Grid in 1988, and she has held various positions in finance, merger integration, corporate affairs, and business operations. She's also spent three years in London as the head of investor relations uh, for National Grid. Um, so we're going to just uh, dive right in, and um, Anne Weeks is going is, is gonna to start. So I'll hand it over to you, Anne. Hello. Let me start my video. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, at first, before I get into the details, I must say it is so good to be at a place in history where there's no longer a question whether the words climate and clean air will appear in an inaugural address or a State of the Union address or the like. Having worked on these issues for decades, we used to take bets on whether our issues would even appear in a presidential agenda at a transition period like this. So I'm in, in extremely grateful for the priority that the new administration is placing on these important questions. Unfortunately, however, the administration is going to need to think a number of U-turns before it engages the gears to move forward. I'm going to really squeeze the heck out of this roadmap idea um, that the American Lung Association has offered me. It may be Regretting that, but anyway, before they, before they engage the gears, they're gonna to have to take some U-turns. Um, they're off to a great start. Uh, we heard from um, Joe Goffman about executive order 13990, which is the one everyone has paid most attention to, I think, protecting public health and the environment and restoring science to tackle the climate crisis, which affirms many goals, um, including science-based public policy making, climate as a priority, reestablishing the interagency working group on the social cost of greenhouse gases, which is very important and doesn't get enough attention, I think. Um, the executive order lists specific priorities uh, for action and um, in some cases directs deadlines for certain actions, which, which is quite important. Uh, and then at the same, on the same day, on day one, this memorandum on modernizing regulatory review, which Kelsey mentioned, would update a 2003 Office of Management and Budget circular that talks about how the benefits and costs of uh, regulatory programs are analyzed. And it would bring it up into the 21st century, quite frankly, um, to reflect the importance of advancements in science and technology to uh, reflect the importance of considering benefits that cannot be monetized or turned into dollars, um, and to reflect the importance of the disparities between communities when thinking about the application of uh, regulatory programs for clean air and climate. Then we had January 27th, which was Climate Day. Uh, again, additional executive orders. But now the rubber has to hit the road. The directives have to be applied. I was encouraged to hear uh, Joe Goffman say that 
not only are the political appointees focused on trying to make a difference here quickly and um, effectively, but also the very talented um, staff at EPA and I'm sure the other agencies as well are ready to go. It is my hope and my certainly my belief that the team that's been uh, put together along with the professionals at the agency are ready to make actions on climate and actions on clean air a priority. And that those are not mutually exclusive goals. Implementing a regulation to control air emissions of, of toxic air pollution, for example, uh, will also achieve um, direct reductions in climate pollution. And I'm, I'm sure that this uh, team is ready to understand that and, and work with that. Um, regulation also can be positively technology forcing, creating incentives for American innovation and new approaches, not just the same bolt on technologies, but really new ideas, um, which creates jobs, jobs of all kinds. And that and it's very important that um, this administration seems very dedicated to the notion that pollution reduction should benefit those who have been most harmed by the air pollution itself. With that frame, our priority actions are, uh, we have 10 rollbacks to watch and what should happen. So, and I'm, I'm also pleased to note that we had recent uh, legal victories. Um, the so-called Affordable Clean Energy Act, uh, clean energy rule uh, went down to, it was vacated by the D DC circuit on January 19th. The uh, rule that we call the censored science rule um, is now gone. That would have uh, forced the agency to give less um, effect to scientific study results where the data could not be made public. Um, now we're looking to see the cost benefit rule that uh, the Trump administration finalized in the waning days of the administration be pulled back and reconsidered. Uh, the climate pollution significance threshold that was included in the power plant carbon rule reaffirmation uh, needs to be um, eliminated. Quite frankly, it has no support in science. Um, the methane policy rule, the methane standards rule for the oil and gas industry, uh, one of my favorites, the power plant air toxic uh, appropriate and necessary determination um, needs to be reinstated and reaffirmed. And then I don't work on them, but the, the vehicle rules, the carbon vehicle rules need to be readdressed. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's very important that the interagency working group begin as soon as possible to reinstate the social cost of carbon for use in valuing air and climate rules. So what's missing? Unfortunately, um, for, from my perspective, uh, the two national ambient air quality standards um, that were decided on in the last days of the Trump administration, and when I say decided on, the Trump administration decided to do nothing about these standards, didn't make it onto the specifically enumerated list of important actions. Um, as priorities for the, for the administration. And I hope that that changes because I think those are the fundamental uh, backbone um, of Clean Air Act rules. Um, and they need to be assessed and, and hopefully quickly strengthened uh, in order to yield benefits for not only all of us, but certainly for communities who are located near uh, major emitters of these two pollutants and their precursors. We went on to see a strong existing power plant rule for carbon dioxide for coal and gas plants. Um, that's absolutely necessary, even if we're going to get halfway to zero by 2035. Um, retrofit carbon capture and sequestration technologies, cleaner fuels, and other innovations need to be engaged. Um, and we're pleased that it sounds like the administration is willing to support investment in the infrastructure necessary to make that happen. 
not a regulatory action, but nevertheless essential to support these technologies that along with renewables, existing nuclear plants, and zero carbon fuels have to be deployed if we are going to meet our nation's robust climate goals. Again, it's important, um, and, and I'm, I'm kind of a climate and clean air nerd here, but it's important for us to recognize all kinds of climate benefits. Uh, it's important for us to recognize all kinds of environmental benefits from these uh, rules and actions, um, those that can be monetized and those that can't. Um, and I'm, I'm encouraged, um, again, in closing, that the administration on, what, week two uh, is, seems to be rushing ahead down the road toward these improvements. Um, I couldn't be more happy about that. Um, and I'm looking forward very much to uh, engaging with them on that. Implementing more protective climate and clean air rules can create a lot of jobs, not just in the infrastructure development space, but also in the research and development space and com in commercial companies to sell and install new kinds of generation. So it's important not only for communities to breathe clean air, nothing could be more important really, but also to have good um, jobs and uh, economic development opportunities, particularly at this difficult time. So having myself lived through the space race and watched the lunar landing, I'm optimistic. We have a long way to go, but we can start making a dent in these problems. We need an all of the above response to climate and clean air, and we need it yesterday. So I'm looking forward to our conversation both here today and in the coming years to come. And now I'm going to turn it over to Adrienne Hollis for her remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for being here. It, it's a privilege to speak with so many esteemed panelists and to speak to so many of you on the topic of climate change, climate action and healthy air excuse me, healthy air and public participation, and what this administration has already done towards those goals. Long before Mr. Eric Garner, an unarmed black man who was killed in 2014 after being put in a chokehold um, by New York City police, or Mr. George Floyd, who was killed last year in Minnesota, or more than 70 other murdered individuals screamed that they could not breathe, communities have been loudly and emphatically and unequivocally stating that, demanding that, saying that they could not breathe, thanks in large part to where they lived and the contaminants to which they were exposed. Their voices, all of their voices were largely ignored. In the United States, systemic racism against black and brown people affects every aspect of our lives from education to employment, from housing to healthcare, from the food we eat to the air we breathe. A 2018 EPA report which examined facilities across the US, across the country that emit air pollution concluded that people of color are much more likely to live near polluters and breathe polluted air, even as that agency sought to roll back regulations on pollution. Those in poverty had 1.35 times higher burdens of facilities than did the overall population and non-whites had 1.28 times. African-Americans had one and a half times a higher burden than did the overall population, which translates into a 54% increase in living near facilities that pollute the environment for African-Americans. We know that people of color are exposed to environmental pollution at a rate that far exceeds their white communities. Um, EPA, the same EPA study I just talked about uh, indicated that inhaling particulate matter, also known as PM, leads to higher rates of asthma, heart attack, and lower life expectancy rates, along with chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. Some particles in particulate matter, such as dust, dirt, soot, or smoke, are large or dark enough to be seen with the naked eye, and others are very, very small. And that exposure is more likely for residents who live in neighborhoods with polluting facilities, as I mentioned, and it underscores the need to clean up these polluted areas. And this is particularly important given that environmental protections that were designed to regulate pollution were either rolled back or suspended. In 2014, 
we, you know, we were told that African-Americans were about three times more likely to die from asthma related causes than white population. Black children are over four times more likely to be admitted to hospitals for asthma compared to their white counterparts. Blacks do not have a higher, uh, prep, do not only have a higher prevalence of asthma than whites, but they are also plagued with higher rates of asthma related morbidity and death. So these multiple factors contribute to this disparity in prevalence rate that we've seen. And it also includes socioeconomic status and other environmental factors. And we've seen the role that it plays um, with the uh, pandemic caused by COVID-19. In, in a June 2020 report, last June from the Rhodium Group, we were told that um, the average Latinx lives in proximity to more traffic when compared to white people. And for black people, the same, um, the same scenario. Both Blacks and Latinos live closer to facilities that transfer, store, or dispose of hazardous waste compared to a white people who live near these um, facilities. And Black people live near facilities that handle, manufacture, use, or store flammable or toxic substances. All of these things can affect not only the respiratory system, but public health in general. And the percent of Black and Latinx people, respectively, um, which is 41 and 46% exposed to diesel particulate matter is ridiculous. And so what we have now, because of all the factors that I mentioned and all of the underlying factors is the syndemic, which is a set of linked health problems. They interact and compound each other's effects. We have COVID-19, structural racism, environmental injustice, and climate change. Any of these on their own are, dead, are deadly. All of them can cause death. In this panel, we're talking about looking ahead, but I believe that in order to make positive impacts and lasting change, to develop a reasonable, accurate roadmap, we need to know where we were, where we came from, and to learn from that history. So quickly, in the last four years, more than 100 environmental regulations have been or were in the progress of being rolled back or overturned. Actually, 98 were completed and 14 were in progress um, which was a total of 112 at the time of that, the end of that administration. Major climate policies were dismantled and many more rules governing clean air, water, wildlife, and toxic chemicals were under attack. Of those like pieces of legislation, 28 completed rollbacks were focused on air pollution and emissions and two were in progress. And I also wanna include regulations on infrastructure and planning because of the potential for exposure um, when you have poor infrastructure, for example, 14 of those were completed. For water pollution, which we can talk about aerosolizing um, contaminants, eight were completed, one was in progress. Toxic substances and safety, nine were completed, one was in progress. That is 63 pieces of legislation that play an important role in protecting public health and have a large impact on the quality of the air we breathe, 63. But the good news, the good news is that to date, President Biden has signed 25 executive orders in just 15 days. While all are very important and very much needed, a few stood out for me and the communities with, with whom I work. And those that directly affect air pollution included those that were related to the climate crisis directly. Tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad and protecting public health and the environment, you've already heard about that from Anne. Those related to COVID-19, including wearing a mask, as, uh, as we are definitely dealing with an airborne um, disease in COVID-19, and there were 12, 12 executive orders that focused on that, although they were mentioned in a number of others. Those that dealt with health equity, um, environmental justice, and disproportionality, there were more than 12 um, executive orders that also uh, recognized that. We're looking forward to watching this administration continue to staff its offices with the focus on ex people experienced in toxics, in cumulative exposures, in environmental justice, in health equity, and most importantly, in abating air pollution, particularly given the role that it has played with COVID-19 infections and deaths. And I, when I talk about that, I'm referring to the studies that have suggested a possible connection between COVID-19 particles and PM, particulate matter. And the suggestion is that um, those particles 
attach themselves to particulate matter, which then embed in the uh, deep part of the law. We'll be advocating for strengthening the Clean Air Act and, can, and um, strengthening or um, increasing the amount of community air monitoring that should occur and stronger emission standards, particularly in the face of extreme weather when facilities shut down in the face of hurricanes, for, for instance, but which also leads to additional air pollution for more public engagement and opportunities for input and more action to protect the public. We'll be looking for decreases in exposure by addressing its um, exposure pathways and eliminating them one by one. Decreases in respiratory health effects and other adverse health effects, all of which are exacerbated by climate change. And of course, because of systemic racism. The Biden-Harris administration's policies, directives to date, lay out a perfect roadmap that provides insight and addresses what is important to protect health. All we need to do is ensure that those activities that are described in those policies like com um, include community air monitoring, include updating hazardous air pollutants, include emission standards, and that those activities are carried out. Thank you for listening. And now I will turn it over to Ali. Thank you, Dr. Hollis, and, and thank you, um, the audience. And I want to also uh, appreciate the um, American Lung Association and American University for uh, hosting this uh, event and inviting me. So last year, we celebrated the Clean Air Act's 50th, 50th anniversary. The Clean Air Act has been enormously successful. It has improved air quality and public health across the nation. This success is in large part um, due to the work of state and local government in coordination and cooperation with the EPA. The division of responsibility, the so-called cooperative federalism is a cornerstone of the Clean Air Act and a key to its success. So I have a few recommendations through a state regulator's lens for Biden administration for tackling climate change and the systemic inequities that uh, have been uh, spoken about. First of all, don't go it alone. Um, state and local programs have been at the forefront of innovation and have tremendous expertise and experience. Most state and local programs are eager to move quickly and assist EPA. EPA should partner with us, consider existing programs and build upon it. Second, focus on environmental justice and equity. We have seen tremendous improvements in national and regional air quality, but not everyone has benefited from these improvements equally. The frontline communities continue to be burdened by air pollution and few programs exist to address cumulative impacts. Attainment of national ambient air quality standards does not mean that air quality is equally protective for everyone living in the county or the region. Environmental justice should not be just a single program within EPA. It should be integrated into every program across EPA. EPA should work with states and other partners to develop an equity, diversity, and inclusion strategy and plan that supports and complements various state and local programs at the forefront. The plan should explicitly offer avenues to integrate communities into the decision-making. That aspect is lacking right now. Thirdly, respect state and local authorities. The last ad administration took aim to undermine longstanding state authorities and those actions should be reversed. EPA should instead nurture and support those efforts. California's authority to regulate motor vehicles and cascading authority granted to other state under section 177 of the Clean Air Act to adopt California's rules should be uh, preserved and by granting the necessary waivers. EPA should also support uh, cooperative efforts among sta states to combat pollution, including those extended to uh, Canadian provinces. Fourth, uh, restore scientific and technical integrity. I think rejecting the so-called secret science rule is a good start, uh, but that's not enough. EPA should revisit the uh, particulate matter, fine particulate matter and ozone uh, national ambient air quality standards because of the deeply flawed way they were adopted. We need to restore consideration of co-benefits and benefit cost analysis that EPA conducts. Uh, EPA should review and reconsider the recent revision to mercury air toxics rule uh, and that withdrew the appropriate and necessary finding that underpins that rule. EPA needs to ensure 
um, re-engagement of its career technical and scientific staff that were sidelined during the last administration. Reliance on the world-class expertise of the staff is a crucial part of restoring the role of science in decision-making. Next, becoming, become a regulator again. Um, this deregulation and stepping back from that responsibility must end. Air toxics and emerging contaminants continue to pose risk and EPA should expand research, develop new regulations and provide support to state and local agencies to address these difficult issues. If they need to prioritize addressing the disproportionate risk faced by frontline communities, develop aggressive and new motor vehicle and heavy duty vehicle standards uh, as the mobile source continues to be a uh, source of contamination and uh, exposure to uh, communities. EPA should revisit greenhouse gas regulations for aircraft and, um, and address emissions from locomotive and ocean going vessels and reimpose the methane leak rule. EPA should provide a meaningful solution for an interstate pollution and take responsibility for addressing international pollution. Next, reset permitting and enforcement priorities to emphasize public health and equity. Efficient permitting and effective enforcement are critical to protecting public health. And the previous administration was obsessed with regulatory relief over what should be the primary mission of air regulators, which is protecting public health from effects of air pollution. EPA should move away from a philosophy of regulating regulatory streamlining that provides multiple exit ramps from applicability of permitting regulations and focus instead on improving the permitting process itself. The cumulative erosion of new source review permitting rules may be beyond repair. Um, EPA should work with state and local agencies to streamline and modernize air permitting process to make them more efficient without weakening public health protection. There may be a, uh, we may need to reimagine in the permitting process uh, for major sources. EPA should expand opportunities for meaningful public engagement and participation in permitting process, particularly in environmental justice communities. Uh, there are a number of decisions and, and, and minor tweaks from redefining what is ambient air uh, that that's pre prevents communities from engagement and involvement. Restore and strengthen enforcement uh, staffing and resources within OECA as Office of Enforcement and, and Compliance Assessment. That is extremely important. Without enforcing, uh, enforcement regulations become uh, virtually meaningless. A recent EPA report found widespread tampering and use of defeat devices in light duty diesel trucks and SUVs amounting to excess emissions that are an order of magnitude higher than those caused by Volkswagen cheating scandal. EPA should prioritize developing a national strategy to address emissions from in-use vehicles and provide support for the existing state programs that do. Finally, uh, they need to significantly increase funding. State and local agencies receive federal grants to support their operations and meet their obligation on the Clean Air Act. These funds were threatened for significant cuts under the last administration and have not been increased in years. The funding level this year was the same level as it was in 2004. It's not even keeping with the uh, cost of uh, uh, the CPI. The administration should advocate for substantial increase in funding for state and local air agencies. The administration's ambitious agenda depends on strong partnerships with the state and local agencies that are adequately resourced and able to fulfill their part of this mission. Finally, I encourage the administration to be bold and innovative. The challenges that we are faced with, faced with cannot be solved with minor tweaks and adjustments. The road ahead is rough and we have a long way to go. We need to go together to reach our destination. So uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to look forward to the discussion and, and now I'll turn it over to Marcy. Thanks Ali and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. And thanks to the rest of the panel for your remarks. I'm Marcy Reed, president of National Grid in Massachusetts. National Grid is a regulated utility delivering electricity, natural gas, and clean energy to 20 million people in New York, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. 
states that have some of the most progressive environmental targets throughout the US. We own a small amount of thermal electric generation in New York, but none in Massachusetts and Rhode Island where electric distribution companies have been precluded from owning generation since the late 1990s. We all know we're at a pivotal point in the energy transition. And yes, utilities too have a role to play in helping to ensure that there's clean air for all our kids to breathe. Our vision is that by 2050, we'll achieve our net zero ambition, working with our customers, communities, and stakeholders. As a utility, we're aware of the responsibility we have, and I'm proud of the progress we've made toward our environmental goals. However, we still have a long way to go to achieve what we need to by mid-century. So what's happened so far at the utility? Um, let's look at our scope one and two emissions, those that are under our direct control. By the end of March, 2019, almost two years ago, we'd reduced our own emissions by 75% compared to 1990 levels. This was driven really by a few things. First, falling emissions from our New York generating portfolio that I mentioned. Also falling methane emissions from our gas network as we replace leaking pipes. Reduced emissions of sulfur hexafluoride, which we use for insulating our electric networks. And we've reduced our current vehicle fleet emissions across our field workforce. We've also made significant strides helping to displace emissions in the states where we operate. For example, across our customer base, we've invested over $4 billion in energy efficiency programs in the last eight years. Over 1.3 million homes and businesses have benefited from energy efficiency upgrades, avoiding over 8.5 million tons of CO2 emissions during that period. I'm a huge fan of energy efficiency projects because our customers reduce emissions and they save money. Also, over the last three years, we've added 1,400 electric vehicle charging ports across our service territory, and we've just received approval to add 16,000 more in New York. We've also partnered with major transit authorities to put more electric city buses on the road. And we facilitated the interconnection of over 2,000 megawatts of solar and 28 megawatts of battery storage. And we're up in the not so sunny Northeast. In the absence of congressional action, we've long supported federal regulations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, mitigate climate impacts and reduce pollution for communities. For example, we were part of the litigation opposing the Trump administration's rollbacks related to emissions for power plants and vehicles. And we applaud President Biden's return to Paris. So that's some of the progress so far, but let's really uh, more important, let's look at uh, the future and working towards net zero. For our scope one and two emissions, we have a few strategies. We'll continue to deliver methane emission reductions through our pipe replacement program. By 2030, we anticipate pipeline emissions will have reduced by 80% against our 1990 baseline. We'll ensure regulatory frameworks are in place that promote environmental objectives, such as electric demand reduction and beneficial electrification. Another key area for us will be in our electric generating plants. Although our contract to supply power to the Long Island Power Authority continues until 2028 in time, we can transform our generating fleet by repowering or replacing existing thermal plants with newer, cleaner forms of generation like renewables or battery storage. By 2030, we anticipate emissions from generation will have reduced by 85%. And we'll convert our own fleet of vehicles to 100% electric by 2030 for our light duty vehicles while pursuing the replacement of our medium and heavy duty vehicles with zero carbon alternatives by 2050. Unlike lots of other utilities, we embraced a goal to reduce our scope three emissions as well to net zero by 2050. We'll accomplish this in a few ways. We've already signed contracts to procure over 200 terawatt hours of, of renewable energy for our Massachusetts and Rhode Island electric customers. This is enough to power supply to half of our customers consumption by 2026. This will displace the equivalent of over 65 million tons of CO2 over the term of the contract. And we'll invest in grid modernization to enable more distributed generation to connect, which will be complemented by investments in smart meters, which can benefit all customers. We'll make significant investments in battery and other storage technologies to address power intermittency issues, 
providing reliable, continuous, and seamless service to our customers. We'll double down on our energy efficiency programs for our customers. In the most recent survey of top states for energy efficiency, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy ranked Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New York second, fourth, and fifth, respectively. And our Massachusetts business was ranked the top energy efficiency utility in the country. Finally, we'll advance clean, clean transportation by reinforcing the grid and facilitating EV charging infrastructure. This year, we'll file for the third phase of our EV infrastructure in Massachusetts, amounting to over 150 million of investment. Our leak foam pipe replacement program in our gas distribution business will continue to deliver on emission reductions in the next decade. We'll work with the broader natural gas industry to reduce upstream, upstream methane emissions from the geologic natural gas that we currently deliver to customers as we transition to renewable natural gas and hydrogen. We'll look at all solutions to decarbonize heat, including electrification, while exploring affordable and achievable pathways for our region that complement today's existing electric and gas networks like geothermal district energy systems. We'll utilize large scale renewables, which will play an integral role in a low carbon future. We'll need a 21st century grid supported by a new transmission investment to help us deliver the output from solar, onshore wind and offshore wind. We'll invest in large scale carbon management technology and carbon offset programs. And the list goes on. So see, like everyone else here, we have a lot going on, but there is indeed so much to do. Uh, I know we all look forward to working with the Biden administration on matters that can help move to a cleaner future for all of us. And with that, having batted cleanup, I will now toss it back to Kelsey for the Q&A. All right. All right. Thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for your, your thorough remarks. We have we have a lot to, to talk about. I think I want to start sort of broad. Um, and I'm and I'm thinking of this first question for 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 Anne or, or Dr. Hollis, um, whoever wants to jump in. Um, you know, how do you think various stakeholders like environmental groups or maybe public interest advocates um, should go about holding the Biden administration accountable? Well, I'll, I'll go first. Um, uh, and first, I, I do want to say that I'm sure you meant to include the, the public, the general public and the community in that regard. And, and um, I think that they, they also have um, a procedure that has been working with the Environmental Justice for All Act with um, Chairman Grijalva and Representative McEachin involving the public and involving all stakeholders early and often from the very beginning, not after uh, 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 legislation has been developed. I think in that way, they develop um, trust and they are, um, reinst I guess, reinstating cred credibility, which we've lost um, these last four years. Yeah. For myself, there are a variety of ways which we engage with the agency when the agency is willing to engage with us. Um, for example, I was on a phone call at uh, lunchtime today with some career staff about what they're doing, what their priorities are, and that kind of informal engagement is terribly important and has to continue um, and uh, be made more robust. Someone on the call today suggested um, reinstatement of uh, regular calls with not just the uh, professional staff, but also the politicals at the at the EPA. So I think that's very important, engaging um, on an ongoing basis on the topics at hand. Um, second, I'm a litigator. I bring legal action. Um, I would prefer not to bring legal action against an administration at this early stage of the game, uh, of course, but um, that is how we engage. Uh, sometimes it's necessary to uh, challenge bad policy or to challenge a missed deadline, to uh, raise um, an action up the priority list. So that's another way of engaging. And the third way of engaging is the standard way that all of the public can engage in federal rulemaking activity. And that is through uh, developing uh, comments to give at public hearings, which are um, offered for every one of the Environmental Protection Agency's uh, rules, 
and uh, working on written statements that go into the agency that they must respond to. There are very many um, and, and robust uh, opportunities to engage. And I would encourage everybody on the program, you know, everyone listening to um, explore those and to really become active in this arena. Uh, it's very important um, and um, there are opportunities there. So, thank you. And, and I wanna just add something quickly. I agree with um, everything Anne said, but I also want to um, add that when it comes to public participation and public comment, public engagement, that this administration has to be sensitive to timing, for example, to location, to the fact that most people work during the days and at night they have to feed their families and you can't wait until the end of a meeting before you engage in public input because the public probably won't be there. You know, So we have to find um, um, ways to that are engaging, but that may be different. We have to think outside the box or the government has to think outside the box. I'll see if I could weigh in on this. Um, I think the how the, we can hold administration accountable is to see whether how things look different um, in the future. If they will, they come up with a plan for um, actually address the EJ across the um, uh, pro, uh, across the agency or not? Will they uh, rulemaking be more inclusive? Um, are they going to provide opportunities for input and, and involvement? How would they how they respond to you know petitions from the um, on, on permit actions and and all of those? I think there's a, there are there are signs that we can watch for um, to see what the you know a lot of the uh, I think U turns that Anne mentioned and and, and see all, are they going to happen uh, and how quickly and how involved are we? Uh, Joe Goffman mentioned partnerships. Um, you know, let's 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 see uh, how we are going to be uh, given seats at the table. I think that's that's how we'll find out. And, I, and I, I'm I'm uh, reasonably confident uh, in the administration. I know Joe, and and you know I think they they'll deliver. But uh, I think the accountability is an important question. Well, you know, I I know several of you talked a couple of you talked about um, environmental justice issues, and so just to let's maybe elaborate, take this time to elaborate on that. You know, President Biden has has vowed to make that kind of a, a centerpiece of his climate agenda. Um, you know, in the past, administrations um, have have used sort of admissions trading schemes that have left you know some communities bearing emission burden from from existing power plants, and so. I'm wondering, you know, how, how can we make sure that, that, that people who live near power plants, um, existing plants, benefit from, from these larger federal policies? Um, I think probably several of you could speak to that, but um, who wants to, to? I wonder if, if I can just start by saying that we will have an opportunity to see how the Biden administration uh, responds to precisely that problem or that issue um, in the coming weeks and months because they have a court order deadline to uh, issue a final rule on something called the cross-state air pollution uh, problem. Um, under the Clean Air Act has a provision known as the good neighbor rule in which facilities upwind are meant to control their emissions so that downwind communities don't have to breathe dirty air. Um, to put it just very basically. Um, unfortunately, the way that uh, previous administrations have worked this rule, a lot of, of existing power plants in particular, because those are the places where cost-effective reductions could be had, were not running their controls. The, the, the standards weren't tight enough to make them run their controls, which meant that downwind communities, and, and there was a cap and trade program set up to enable that. So what that meant was um, it might have been beneficial to downwind communities, but some of the communities next to the power plants were not necessarily reaping those benefits. And we've encouraged the, uh, the agency to tighten the standards so that the power plants that have controls on them run those controls. And the power plants that don't have controls on them put controls on them to um, actually allow downwind areas to achieve the standards, which in a couple of, well, more than a couple, uh, a lot of the East Coast has not occurred yet. 
So um, I think we have an opportunity. This is due out in the middle of March. So we will see what the administration does uh, at that time. So, so uh, the market solutions aren't going to solve the EJ and disparate impact by themselves. We have to put our finger, our thumb on the scale, and it has to be intentional on part of the um, rulemaking, and it's got to be built into the design of the program. I think there's a um, uh, sort of the philosophy of, you know, let's let the market decide has shown us what happened. Uh, it, it results in, you know, as Anne was pointing out, uh, power plants that installed, you know, millions of dollars in controls not running them because it's cheaper to buy allowances. It results in, uh, you know, the, the uh, underachieving uh, the objective is it results in controls not going in places that would benefit the uh, the communities that are adjacent to it. So I think it's it needs to uh, you know I'm not against the um, market, uh, but you, it needs to be dovetailed with a minimum set of controls um, that uh, it sets a floor. And then you know if you go beyond that, that's where markets allow us the opportunity to be more ambitious. And said, said, let us find ways to be more protective than you can otherwise be uh, by regular controls. So that, you know, that, that's where I leave it. So. And I'll well, just add on to that. I think <laughs> that uh, the thumb on the scale comment, Ali, is, is exactly right. Um, there are lots of utilities and power generating companies out there that do exactly as you say. And then there are others um, that don't. You know, we do use the controls that we have. But, you know, one of the um, best things that we've seen so far out of the Biden-Harris administration is the, uh, you know, the naming of both John Kerry and Gina McCarthy, who are already very deep into talking to, um, whether it's utility sector, and, and the, I know the automotive sector about when it comes to transportation, which is a huge, a huge um, source of emissions. And, and, and I can tell you firsthand that practical conversations that we're having with these people about what can be done to help move um, and put that thumb on the scale, Ali. Exactly that. Um, and I'd like to add, if you, if I can, Kelsey, that um, you know one of the things that I've been following is under the Administrative Procedures Act, there's a good a good cause um, loophole, I like to call it, that has prevented or that has allowed EPA to and other agencies not to hold public meetings, not to do community engagement because they think uh, their reasoning is that it's not worth it or it's not necessary. And so seeing less of that clause, which was used a lot these last four years and more opportunities is important. Aside from that, um, I think that one thing that we're gonna be uh, looking for is um, how EPA in particular responds to uh, emergencies. For example, if you recall, uh, the hurricane, I think it was Hurricane Laura in Louisiana, um, occurred at a time when EPA had decided to um, lift oversight from facilities that release um, hazardous chemicals into, into the environment. So during the hurricane, uh, although they did uh, invite communities to continue to report um, any releases that occurred, which they have already had already been doing, but at the same time as you had this um, lifting of the ban, as, as, if you will. Um, you also had the hurricane, you also had the biolab fire, and you also had um, um, heat days, and you had a stay at home order. So you had all of these cumulative um, effects that led to, um, that really um, made up this pandemic where people were exposed because they were in their home, they couldn't use their air condition, it was hot, they had contaminants in the environment already and additional ones from biolab. So we need to see less laxity when it comes to protections and, and more enforcement. And I think that is going to be the game changer. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And actually I was going to, to, to bring up environmental enforcement. Um, that's something that has been, we've seen declining for, for, for several years. Um, and I'm wondering what are your ideas about you know how the Biden administration should should focus on environmental enforcement. Well, well and um, just from talking to a lot of um, my community partners, one of the things is we see less enforcement in certain communities, and that's something that we need to address. And by certain communities, I mean communities that are made made up primarily of people of color. 
a low socioeconomic status. In addition, we need to see, uh, we see less enforcement when we're talking about partners for profit. When you're talking about partnering with big industry or the potential polluters, and we need to see less of that partnership and more of the partnership that's gonna protect the public. So enforcement and um, enforcement um, guidelines need to be strengthened. And this is where science plays such an important role and, and why I'm so excited to see that the president recognizes that and welcomes that input from science and scientists, as well as um, citizen science, community science. And um, Ollie, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, a, uh, thank you. Um, I, I, I agree with, um, Adrian, 100%. I think it's the uh, use of technology um, is uh, is going to give us new tools for enforcement. Um, but I think it's also that um, the it's it, I think the administration needs to look at some of the weakening of the rules that have made the enforcement actually more difficult. Uh, you know, trying to figure out what the compliance obligation for the source is. You know, from a, our uh, experience in the permitting rule. You know, when when you look at it. Um, when the, uh, the, the, the commitments for uh, emissions to give app actually determine what their applicability is, is not a, a, an enforceable commitment. It's, it's something that they guess at. And, and if they miss the guess, it's well, oh well, they get, they get to redo. That's really hard um, to launch an, um, an enforcement action against the, a rule that's written like that. So they, they need to tighten those. Uh, so to provide opportunities um, to actually enforce the requirements. Um, I think there, there is some, uh, you know, we need to uh, in, expand our uh, monitoring network so that we can actually detect and address those, uh, uh, the, the com those needs that, of the communities if there are the disparities that exist, identified and make it actionable. So there's a lot that can be done. I mentioned the, um, you know, um, the erosion that we've seen in uh, diesel vehicles. And, and I think that's, you know, some of that is, uh, you know, uh, you, you, those, uh, the rules that uh, so reg regulatory and um, um, enforcement authorities exist, uh, just need to have actually direct uh, the resources to find those and, and enforce it. Um, you know, EPA, for instance, our wood stove, um, it's, which is a big, big issue for us in, in Northwest. Um, those, uh, um, the EPA last administration was um, sort of saying that's not a low priority for us to enforce the new standards, which came 20 years too late um, in place. And, and after five years of heads up with the, uh, the industry, but they were just uh, um, still trying to drag in their feet to, um, to implement those uh, requirements. And EPA was uh, saying that last administration, that's a low priority. Uh, well, obviously the compliance uh, is going to be a, you know, low rates. So those things, they, there needs to be a change in uh, approach, change in attitude. Okay. Um, let's, I want to kind of go back to Marcy quickly and she touched on something that I, th I think is interesting about sort of, I, I'm wondering if, if, if writ large, you think there's a shift happening among utilities and the gas industry in terms of, of energy consumption? Uh, yeah, so I've been at National Grid for going on 33 years. So I've been here a long time seeing a lot of how um, utilities have embraced or not uh, the science of climate change. Um, it's truly different from even just a few years ago. Most utilities at EEI, the Electric uh, Edison Institute, so the Electric um, trade group are adopting net zero aspirations, most, not all. Even at the American Gas Association, we're having conversations about sustainability, decarbonization, electrification. Is there really a gas business in, in, at 2050? And I can tell you, these are, you know, this is how we think at our executive table. We have, you know, we're thinking forward about how do we get to net zero and is that even enough? Um, and then you go to the, the broader table at the national level and you can imagine there are various views. Um, though I think National Grid was one of the early ad adopters and we are honestly passionate about uh, cleaning up the air. Um, not, not everybody else is, but I, I, am, I am actually surprised at uh, the number of folks who are having conversations, even from states where you might not think 
uh, where you might not expect it. Uh, so folks are getting on the bus, some more quickly than others. Um, I will say that I am enthusiastic about the progress that's being made. Um, there's still a ton to do. And, um, you know, National Grid, along with uh, a small handful of others, pride ourselves in trying to drag the pack along with us and showing them ways that are both good for the environment and can still be good for business and our customers. So yeah, I think there's a shift is the short answer. All right. Um, I think we're going to open it up to some, some audience questions um, now. So I know we've had, had several of them, you know, dozens of them come in and um, just to, to start us off, um, we have someone asking that, someone saying that we saw many abuses from the Trump administration and one was appointing advisory board members who were both conflicted and lacked the scientific expertise to provide input to the EPA policymaking process. And so what does the Biden administration need to do to remove uh, unqualified Trump holdovers and to prevent future abuses of the appointment process for these advisory panels uh, at EPA and, and across the government. Um, um, gonna take a I, I, I can take a quick stab and just say that I was happy to see um, one of the first actions coming out of the administration, uh, this memorandum on restoring trust um, through scientific integrity and evidence-based policymaking, a uh, long title for um, a very straight to the point memorandum that, that said, um, we need to look at all of the scientific advisory committees that uh, the agencies rely on and we need to make sure that they're full of competent people. I, I take that as a very positive first step that this came out within a week of the inauguration. So I'm hopeful. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of just to follow up on that. I mean, what, what about hiring, you know, rehiring um, scientists across the agencies that may have left in recent years, you know, as baby boomers have aged and retired and, you know, there've been accounts of scientists who have left uh, under the Trump administration felt like they had been silenced. Um, do you have thoughts about what the administration can do to kind of bring in bring in maybe young people or bring peace, you know scientific experts back into government. But, um, Kelsey, if I may, uh, there, there are two issues I think you you're uh, touching on. One is sort of the succession planning. As we um, you know we're all getting grayer and the let's say the, the the silver tsunami coming our way. I think that um, a lot of us are the 1990 Clean Air Amendment um, uh, recruits, and I think those that generation is uh, reaching retirement, and, and 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 who who is going to step up and and take over that? I think that's a big issue at state and and EPA level. Um, I think we all we all facing that level of expertise. Who's going to? What's the ne next generation that's going to come in here and 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 replace these long um, career staff? Uh, and I think that you know. A lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it, you know, it's it's going to be really hard. People who have dedicated their lives to this mission. I haven't seen a huge turnover at, at EPA staffing under Trump. They, they, the staff has been extremely resilient. Um, that's my observation, and they they sort of they survived uh, uh, the, uh, the that that administration. And I think they're they're eager to step back up and and back into the role and 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 do this. But I think the question around the uh, how you form the panels and outside experts. Uh, it, it, if the administration wants to um, get scientific answers, in, you know, they, they'll, they'll recruit and appoint uh, experts on the panel. And that's, that's a good litmus test for us. And we said, how would, how would we know? Take a look and see who they put on the panel. If uh, you know, last administration, um, there was not a single epidemiologist on their PM panel. Um, you know, so they, you know, it's it's a uh, you know they reduce that number. So it, it it's I think there uh, there we have lots of experts. We have lots of um, qualified people, um, and uh, you know, getting Dr. Frey, for instance, back as a science advisor to EPA is a is a is a good sign um, that I'm I'm looking at as as saying that this is you know this is a hopeful sign. Right. Thanks. Um, we have an, another participant saying, "At last, we're back in the Paris Accord." Now, what does the U.S. need to do to play catch up, to reach critical target goals, and how do we set an example for and encourage other nations 
um, to set up their actions. Does anyone want to? Well, I think I touched on that in my remarks. I think we need to start off with the uh, two largest emitting carbon and methane sectors, uh, power industry and oil and gas development uh, and distribution sectors. Um, Marcy's comments tell us that if you take action to reduce leaks, you can get a lot of methane uh, reduction um, from simple maintenance, really, and replacement of, of infrastructure. It's expensive. Um, all of this is going to have some cost to it. There's no doubt about that. Um, but we have to do it. it and I think um, there are some low-hanging fruit in the power sector and in the oil and gas development sector uh, to make a difference there. And I think we need to show that we mean what we say when we uh, are going back to, to Paris, that, that the, the targets have to be meaningful and that the United States is going to take some regulatory actions that um, promote cleaner energy. Uh, while the previous administration was rolling things back, the states have been stepping up with clean energy standards, and um, or at least some states have, uh, to try to hold on to their uh, zero carbon and near carbon and near zero carbon free generation and, and to uh, put some controls on um, methane distribution and methane uh, development, uh, sorry, natural gas development. Um, and I think you know actions like that are going to make a difference. All right. Uh, we have can, can I just add to that? In addition to that, I just wanted to once again talk. I mentioned this already, but I think it's important to look at the emission standards, and which is why I said I'm so excited that science has become such a, a, the recognition of the importance of science and scientists in this administration is so impactful because we need to look at the emission standards and strengthen them. And you know that is one of the, the uh, I think in a, another immediate action that we can engage in because once we start doing that and decreasing, you know, uh, um, our contribution in that regard, you know, we're going a long way towards setting an example for other countries. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and you know, actually, I have a, a, another audi uh, audience question that is. Um, directed to, to you, Dr. Hollis. So while I have you, um, this person is asking if you would describe an effective uh, community air monitoring, monitoring program and uh, the resulting benefits. Okay, I answered them in the chat, but I'll, I'll say it out loud for everybody. I said um, that um, there are a number of factors. The first thing would be to, um, in, uh, to um, move the monitors into the community in order to put them in the best places that would, you would have to have input from those who are observing um, these adverse uh, activities. And a, a quick example in a community in Arkansas would see, um, literally see an air plume come as it came down the street and see the birds falling from the sky. Yet there were no monitors placed in that community in this area where they saw these conditions. And so that's why it's important when we talk about monitoring that we need to have input on the best locations for them. We also need to have an independent analysis of the data from monitoring. Um, hopefully we have um, standards that have been set across the board so that everyone has the same guidelines. And as a part of monitoring, there needs to be um, an immediate response when there are um, releases. It doesn't matter whether it's accidental, whether it's shut up, whether it's <laughs> a startup shutdown or maintenance. And we need to have uh, in place um, um, monetary, um, oh, I don't want to say punishments, but I can't think of the other word right now. I'm drawing a blank um, for, for entities that do, enga that do engage in those emissions, in those now illegal emissions. And those are just a few things, yeah. Mm -hmm. Kelsey, I would I add to that, it would be great to have more monitors. There are, uh, the monitors that are in place right now are old, and some of them have uh, just broken. Um, and there has been very little investment, I understand uh, this from talking to people at the agency, there's been very little investment in updating the monitoring system we, are, we already have. So um, now in addition to properly placed monitors, which I totally agree with, I think we need more of them and we need them to be modernized. 
Mm -hmm. Kelsey, I was going to just add, um, not on the specific topic of uh, air monitoring programs, but when you're in your question, you talked about the community and how can we create effective community. Um, I'm going to say partnerships, slightly changing the question. One of the best things that we've done at National Grid is go out into the community and embrace groups who have a different opinion from us. So, for example, there's a fantastic group called Mothers Out Front. Massive shout out to them. They're helping us to look in the mirror. And frankly, they have helped shape some of the changes that we're making, not in air monitoring program that you just talked about, but just in, you know, sort of all of the, um, the solutions that, we've, that we look for um, and in ways we think we can improve. You know, we're stuck inside the four walls of the utility to be able to go outside and embrace other groups in the community and use Mothers Out Front as an example. For us, it's made all the difference. Thanks. Um, so I guess uh, I know we're getting close to the end here, but I want to talk a little bit about um, legislative action. We've talked a, you know, a bit about regulatory action uh, a lot today, and I'm wondering if anyone wants to um, weigh in a little bit about what they, um, what they see as possible for Biden and Congress to, to do on, on climate policy in the next few years. So I, I wish I I'd go, go ahead. You go ahead. No, you go ahead, Al. No, it's, it, 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 it uh, it's, uh, depends on filibuster rule, right? Uh, so that's one of the things. And, and the other one, you know, I just don't, I'm not optimistic about a legislative solution here um, in, in near term. And again, looking back, uh, this this shouldn't be a uh, an issue, but it is. It's it's one that you know I don't, I don't see a um, coalition built around you know some of the uh, legislative uh, changes that we actually need. For instance, I think that addressing climate issues would be best done through a um, national legislation. I think that's you know, and I'm trying to you know we. We've seen how the uh, administrative uh, solutions have run into trouble, um, you know, through the uh, regulation. And it's a Clean Air Act is a clunky way of addressing it. I think there are some creative ways of of using Clean Air Act. Um, there's been a, a lot of suggestions there, but you know, I think that in the last day on the 19th of January, that administrators real are just responded to a few of the petitions and shut the door on a whole lot of approaches that were being suggested. Um, uh, for action. So it is, um, you know, I, I, I don't hold high hopes. Uh, in a way, also, you know, you got to think about do we want to um, open up the Clean Air Act under, in the current conditions, or what do you end up with if you do um, expose that? And, and, you know, you may end up with something that weakens as opposed to strengthen uh, what we're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is always a concern. Uh, particularly with a, a Congress as divided as this one. I think there is, uh, as I think I said in my, in my remarks, we need an all of the above approach. Um, I certainly would not sit uh, idly by and hope for a legislative solution uh, and not continue to pursue all of the avenues we have under the Clean Air Act to try to get uh, climate reductions, whether they're uh, climate co-benefits through traditional um, pollution rulemaking, or whether they are direct climate uh, rules. Um, uh, it's, it's nice that we can even be talking about a congressional solution, but like Ali, I'm not, I'm not enormously hopeful. <laughs> All right, well, I wanna thank um, everyone um, for, their, for their expertise. This has been, um, you know, incredibly informative. So thank you. Thank you all. And I am actually going to just pass it over to Dan Fiorino for uh, closing remarks. Great. Thank you, Kelsey. And, and thank you to all our panelists, Adrian, Ali, Marcy, and Anne, and uh, Joe Goffman for, for joining us. I am Dan Fiorino. I'm director of the Center for Environmental Policy at American University. We've had this uh, great and fruitful collaboration with the American Lung Association and our own Center for Environmental Filmmaking. Um, and there will be uh, future programs uh, along lines of, of clean air and climate and the close connections between them. 
Uh, it's great to hear from Joe that EPA is back in the clean air and climate business. Just briefly, I thought I'd pull out a couple of themes and we'll, we'll wrap up for today. Um, restoration was one theme. There, there's a lot of work to do to restore science to its rightful place in responsible decision making, to change a lot of policies that were undone in the last four years that undermine health protection and climate action. And I also appreciated hearing that we need to you know, get back to recognizing the value of smart, smart policy uh, in, in uh, terms like the social cost of carbon and recognizing the co-benefits of air and climate action. Uh, we heard a lot about partnerships and engagement. Uh, the states play a vital role. I think it's not as a collaborative relationship as it used to be, although it de depends on uh, the politics of the situation. Uh, partnerships with communities. We certainly heard a lot about, and, and we have lots and lots of evidence about disparities in health and environmental protection. Um, I appreciated the many comments on the need for for better, uh, more finely tuned granular air quality monitoring. If we don't understand the problems, we can't really come up with solutions. Um, so I thought that all was important. And partnerships with utilities. Utilities play an important role um, in this clean air and climate struggle. And it's good to hear about progressive utilities taking action. And finally, uh, credibility and justice. Um, Science is one way of establishing credibility, recognizing um, injustices in environmental protection is another way to create credibility, using science with transparency and integrity, certainly. Um, and those are all ways that I think we can re-engage and rebuild credibility for environmental protection. So the roadmap um, really points us to a, a very busy highway. I think there's a, a, a lot to be done. We thank you very much for joining us today for this discussion. Uh, we invite you to look out for further events in our series on clean air and climate. And until then, um, we look forward to seeing you the next time. Good afternoon.